their cruiser sphincter dyssynergia. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, I'm speaking from halfway across the world, and I think I must start by telling you where I am. So I'm located in Hyderabad in India, which is almost exactly 10,000 miles, or if you follow the SI system, 16,000 kilometers uh, from Bogota. And uh, uh, the genesis of today's discussion probably lies in our social media interaction, where we realized that we both, Professor uh, Ulian and myself, had certain commonality of thought regarding BSD. And uh, we thought it would be nice to do this discussion. So I'm sitting in Hyderabad, which is in the southern part of India. Uh, it's uh, one of the six big metropolises in India. Hyderabad, as Indian cities go, is a fairly new city established. The modern Hyderabad was established in uh, about 500 years uh, ago. And uh, uh, in some form, Hyderabad actually has been part of certain kingdoms from about 600 uh, AD. Uh, so it's it's a fairly large city. We have about 6 million people in Hyderabad uh, with IT, pharma, defense, and aerospace companies. We have a lot of uh, international companies located in Hyderabad. Uh, this is the Golconda Fort. And for those of you who are golfing aficionados, uh, there's a wonderful heritage golf course which is located within the precincts uh, of this fort. Uh, and this is the famous iconic Charminar monument, which was built in 1591 AD, uh, which is in the heart of the old part of the city. Uh, this is how it appears when it's lighted up in the night. This is where I work, Apollo Hospitals. And Apollo Hospitals uh, is a chain of hospitals, which is India's largest and uh, oldest chain of hospitals, more than 70 hospitals, uh, 10,000 beds, uh, with a whole lot of uh, presence across the entire healthcare sector. So I'm going to start with a question, and I wish I could see your faces, I can't. But that question is, which Colombian person is a household name, but not a household face in India? I wish I could have asked this from you in person. I can't, so I need to give you the answer. Well, some of you might have guessed it. The answer is this lady, Shakira. Everybody knows Shakira in India. Everybody's heard of her songs. Most of the people have heard her songs, but I don't think too many people would recognize her face. Uh, but she's, she's very well known uh, across India. And I have one more question for you before you go on to urology. And that's a question pertaining to football. And which is the greatest goal in football, at least for people of my generation? And again, I can't ask it from you in person. But for me, this goal by Maradona from Argentina in 1986 in the semi-finals against England. That was the goal of a wizard. So I thought these are moments and people who enable us to connect across different societies, cultures from far away. And I can still remember the thrill I felt in my heart when I saw Maradona score that goal. So let's get on to the subject of today. And let me start by a very brief discussion of what's the normal behavior of the urethral sphincter. So we know that the urethra opens and is continuously relaxed to allow micturation at a normal pressure with a normal flow so that the bladder empties completely at the time of passing urine. This voiding of urine is prompted by a detrusor contraction and by the simultaneous relaxation of all parts of the sphincteric mechanism. So the smooth sphincter or the internal sphincter the striated sphincter, the pelvic floor muscles, all relax to allow urine to come out freely. So let's look at a urodynamic trace to understand this better. And I'll first tell you about this trace. So that first line, the blue line is the bladder. The red line is rectum. Third line, which is in green, is the detrusor pressure. That's the flow line, the voided volume, the, fill, void, the amount that has been filled into the bladder. And that's the EMG. And let's take a look very quickly at the quality of the trace. You can see the resting pressure starts at about 40 centimeters here for somebody who's standing, which is fine. The initial p -debt is around zero. You can see here periodic coughs, and there's a good subtraction of the cough. There's a cough before the patient starts voiding, and there's a cough at the end. All these are good 
quality control measures which you can check. You can see that the fine pattern of the trace matches. That tells you that it's a good quality trace. Now what you see is during filling, and this is where the filling has happened, during filling, the bladder pressures are low. And as the bladder fills up, you can see that there's a progressive rise in the EMG activity in the, in the pelvic floor. So th these are, this is EMG recorded from surface electrodes. And you can see here that there's a gradual increase in the EMG activity, which is also called as the guarding reflex. And this EMG activity becomes silent at the time of voiding. So you can see this is the time at voiding. And in fact, the silence is just a little before the start of the detrusor contraction. So in fact, the first step in the voiding reflex is a relaxation of the outlet mechanism before the contraction of the detrusor starts. And you can see that very well in this uh, tracing. What is important to note here is that on an EMG, the absolute amount of deflections are not really important. What's important is the relative amount of deflection that you get from the EMG electrodes rather than the absolute measurements. So you must have the storage as the baseline, the EMG activity during storage. That baseline tells you whether the EMG is more active or less active during voiding. So the, the, the baseline for comparison is storage. So then what is detrusor sphincter dysynergia or DSD? So this is defined as a discoordination between the detrusor and smooth or striated sphincter function during voiding due to a neurological abnormality. That is a detrusor contraction synonymous with contraction of the urethral or the periurethral striated muscles. So in other words, you have an incoordination or a discoordination between the bladder and the outlet. And there is a well-defined neurological problem underlying it. So if you do not have a neurological problem underlying it, you will not label it as detrusor sphincter dysynergy or DSD. Those patients are usually clubbed under dysfunctional voiding, although there are certain limitations to that definition as well. So this is the ICS, International Continent Society definition. And toward the end of this presentation, we will revisit this slide to understand what are the limitations of this definition. So what are the implications of DSD? We understand that a large proportion of patients who have DSD, if not given adequate treatment, will develop upper tract changes. So they develop secondary vesicourethral reflux. They develop hydronephrosis. They can get into urosepsis, stone formation. They're also more prone to getting autonomic dysreflexia if the level of the lesion is high enough, cervical or upper thoracic. Uh, and men seem to be at higher risk for developing these changes. So clearly, the presence of DSD tells you that this is a patient at risk. And that's where the importance of the condition lies. So let's take a look at the neural control and the implications. So this is a very rudimentary drawing of the, of the nervous system that I did using my, my laptop and my cursor. So you can see here that that's the brain. That's the brain stem and the pontine micturition center, the spinal cord, the sympathetic outflow, and the parasympathetic. And you can see here, if you have a lesion above the pontine micturition center, then you have coordinated sphincters. So the voiding is synergic. In such a situation, you get detrusor overactivity. You can get symptoms of overactive bladder. You have loss of volitional control. There could be cognitive dysfunction, and sometimes you could also have underactivity of the detrusor. If you have a lesion which is above the sympathetic outflow, you get an incoordination of both the smooth and the striated sphincter mechanism because a smooth sphincter mechanism is, has its nerve supply from the sympathetic system. You get detrusor overactivity, you get detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, and ill sustained detrusor contraction, often though not always and the risk of autonomic dysreflexia, as we just mentioned. And if you have a lesion which is above the parasympathetic outflow, you get incoordinated sphincters again. So you again get DSD, but this is primarily only of the striated sphincter. And you have acontractility often, poor compliance, non-relaxing striated sphincter and stress leak. So you can see here that uh, 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 lesions in different parts of the, of the neurological tract 
uh, will give rise to different uh, set of conditions. I should clarify here that uh, depending on where actually the lesion is, if the lesion actually involves the parasympathetic outflow, you get a contractility. But if it's above, then you'll not have a contractility. You'll again have that was overactivity. Right. So what are the conditions associated with DST? Spinal cord injury, uh, especially if it's a high spinal cord injury, is very likely to produce DST. Multiple sclerosis, about a third of patients who present for urodynamics with lower tract symptoms and multiple sclerosis in a recent systematic review were found to have uh, DSD. Patients with transverse myelitis. Open spinal dystrophism. This is distressingly common currently in our country. Uh, I'm not sure how common it is in, in South America or Latin America, but it's fairly common still in our country. And up to 50% of these children will have detrusive sphincter dyssynergia and multi-system atrophy. And we know that the presence of DSD in multi-system atrophy is what makes DSD, uh, uh, multi-system atrophy, so much more difficult to manage if the patients have voiding dysfunction in, compared, in comparison to patients who have Parkinsonism, where typically you do not have DSD, you have a coordinated striated sphincter activity. So what are certain related conditions? So there are some conditions which can get confused with DST. The first is a, a term which has been used, pseudo dyssynergia. So it is a dyssynergia, but it's not a true dyssynergia. This could be because of a voluntary contraction of the striated sphincters in patients with a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke. So these are patients with CVA or stroke who get phasic contractions and then use voluntary sphincteric activity to try and prevent a leak. And that gets picked up as a pseudo dyssynergia. You could also get dyssynergic striated sphincter activity in patients out of a response to pain. So when you do the urodynamics that the patient is in pain, that can produce a, a reaction where the pelvic floor and striated sphincter become overactive. And so you, you find that there is a kind of dyssynergia, but it's not truly a dyssynergia. It can happen because of abdominal straining. We also know that if the, if the rectum is loaded, if the patient is embarrassed, all these things can actually induce a pseudo dyssynergia when it's not really there. The other term is Brady dis, bradykinesia of the striated sphincter. A bradykinesia, as the, as the term implies, is a delay in the relaxation of the sphincter. And this typically happens in Parkinson's and Parkinson-related disorders, where the striated sphincter is coordinated but because of the bradykinesia, which all the striated muscles have in Parkinsonism, there's a delay in the relaxation. So although the signal has gone to the striated sphincter that it's supposed to relax during voiding, that signal takes time to actually get executed. And so you have a delayed relaxation. And finally, you have dysfunctional void, which is an intermittent or fluctuating flow due to an involuntary or intermittent uh, contraction of the perirethral striated sphincter or levator muscles. But the key difference in a neurologically intact individual. So if you have a neurologically intact individual with dyssynergic striated sphincteric activity, we call it dysfunctional void. And when the patient has a neurological lesion, it would be called as dead who's a sphincter dyssynergia. There are some limitations to the definition of dysfunctional void, but this is not the right time to be discussing it. So how do we make a diagnosis? We can make a diagnosis by various different methods. It could be by EMG during urodynamics. It could be by a micturating cystoerythrogram, by video urodynamics, or urethral pressure profile. So clearly, the micturating cystoerythrogram on its own will not enable the diagnosis, but you need to combine it with the, with the a standard urodynamics to make your diagnosis. So any of these four methods could be used to make a diagnosis of detrusive sphincter dyssynergia. And we'll just examine them a little bit more. So when you do a, an EMG, the EMG could either be a surface patch electrode EMG, which is the overwhelmingly common method by which we do EMG of the, of the sphincter. Uh, remember, when you use patch electrodes, you are getting a summation of all the pelvic floor activity. So it's not just picking up striated sphincter activity of the, of the striated urethral sphincter. You also pick up the, the external anal sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles. So all these combine to give you the signal which is picked up by patch electrodes placed perianally in the perineum. So on EMG, you could classify, DSD has been classified by Blavis into by Jerry Blavis into three different types. 
Type one is where you have an initial rise of sphincteric activity, and then when the detrusor pressure reaches its peak, the, the sphincteric activity falls and voiding happens. So an initial dyssynergic activity, and then it flattens out. Type two is where you keep getting intermittent contractions of the striated sphincter all through the voiding. So you get a contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation through the voiding. And type three is where you have a fixed contraction of the striated sphincter all through. So you don't have this clonic rise and fall. It's a, it's a continuous, ex, uh, strong uh, sphincteric activity all through the void. So these are three different types of DSD described by Blavis. Welk in 2000 actually uh, made a slight uh, 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 modification to this, and he described uh, DSD as either an intermittent DSD or a continuous DSD. So he just reclassified them. And what he showed was that regardless of whether the lesion was in the cervical thoracic or lumbar area, there was no difference in whether you would get a continuous or an intermittent form of DSD. So these are representations of what you would get in a type one. So you can see an initial sphincteric activity, then the sphincteric activity reduces and you find that the void happens, or you get a clonic in type two, or in type three where you have a continuous sustained increase in sphincteric activity. But all this is fine theoretically. From a practical point of view, I've never seen any convincing evidence of a clinical relevance to these classifications. So I don't think that there's a true clinical relevance or there's some conjecture about how there may be some differences in the way you could manage these patients. But really, I don't think there's a good clinical evidence that it makes a difference. So if you make a diagnosis of DSD, I, it's, if, if DSD is there, all the implications of DSD immediately come in regardless of whether it's type 1, type 2, type 3, intermittent or continuous, really doesn't matter. The implications of the diagnosis of DSD remain regardless of the subclassification that the patient might fall under. But there are some problems when we do EMG diagnosis of DSD. What are these problems? The first is that you can have a misfiring of the sphincter. So if some fluid falls over the surface electrode, so let's say you know there's a spill of saline or, or urine trickles onto the electrode, sometimes moisture can cause a misfiring. And you might misinterpret this as a, a, as a dyssynergia. Remember of all the aspects of urodynamic evaluation, the EMG is the least reliable. So I'll repeat that of all aspects of urodynamic testing, the EMG is the least reliable point part. So always be careful in interpreting the EMG findings. Never interpret them in isolation. So personally, if the EMG finding fits in with my clinical diagnosis, I would keep it. If the EMG finding does not fit in with my clinical diagnosis, I might not consider it. So I'd be very careful in making a diagnosis just on the basis of the EMG, unless everything else supports uh, what the EMG shows. Abdominal strain can increase in EMG activity. As I said, pain, discomfort, all these can cause EMG activity. And sometimes you have a lack of sensitivity. And this is not, this is not uncommon at all. So if, if the patient is obese, there's a lot of fat, or there's a lot of hair-bearing uh, skin in the perineum. Uh, sometimes electrical conductivity is not good. And so you don't pick up the dyssynergia, despite the fact that it is there. So the signals don't work very well. So you can see here, in this particular patient, you do find that there's striated sphincter activity here, which is increased at the time avoiding. But with the patient showing so much of abdominal strain, you can't really base your decision as to whether this is dyssynergia or not just on the basis of this. So if this fits in with everything else that the patient has, then I would label this as dyssynergia. If it doesn't, I'd be very careful. Because all through the period when the patient is voiding, you can see the patient is straining. And straining can itself produce striated sphincteric activity. There's another issue where people have tried to correlate between sphincter activity and flow, trying to show that the flow tends to happen when the sphincter becomes silent. Uh, this is, uh, this is one method that people have used to try and show that it's the sphincter which is resisting flows. So when the sphincter contracts, the flow slows down. But the problem here is that the flow response lags behind the sphincter. Because when the patient passes urine, this urine has to go cross through the urethra, come out through the meters, go into the Euroflow meter, and then has to get recorded. It gets damped. So there's a slight lag in the response, but the striated sphincteric activity is almost instantaneous. So because of this, 
your our ability to correlate between at what point the sphincter shows an extra contraction and at what point the patient actually has flow happening that correlation is difficult to make when the striated sphincteric activity is changing very rapidly so if you have a sustained period like this point where the sphincter becomes silent you can see that flow happens but really it's very difficult to tell in this kind of a zone where there is contraction and relaxation happening rapidly as to where whether the flow comes down when there is a sphincteric contraction Let's take a look at this second method of making a diagnosis. And this is a patient who had a fall. This patient, I think, came from Somalia, if I remember correctly, had a fall 12 years ago and a fracture to D11 and uh, L1 neurological uh, lesions. And you can see here, when we're filling the bladder in this patient, then, sorry, when we're filling the bladder in this patient, the bladder shows a grossly abnormal morphology. You can see here, this is not a normal looking bladder. Look at the bladder morphology, not normal. Okay. And as we fill, you can see the bladder neck is open. That's the bladder neck. And let me straight go to the place where this patient has an involuntary contraction. Now remember, there's an involuntary contraction here. This is a spontaneous rectal contraction. That's why there's an artifact here. But you can see here at this point, uh, when there is a contraction, there is a contraction, and there's a little bit of urine leaking here. And just see here what happens. You can see that there's a, there's a gross dilatation of the prostatic urethra. There's some intraprostatic reflux of contrast telling you that the pressure within the prostatic urethra is high. Uh, some reflux happening in the Cowper's glands. So this is a classical detrusor sphincter dyssynergia with a gross dilatation of the pelvic of the of the prostatic urethra uh, at the time of a contraction. You can make a diagnosis of DSD on urethral pressure profile also, although most units don't do this. And although we do urethral prof prof pressure profile once in a while, at this point, we're not commonly using it uh, for our patients. Uh, this is not mine. This is from uh, uh, Dr. Stoffel's article in 2016. Uh, you can see here that any rise in intraurethral pressure, which is more than 20 centimeters more than uh, the detrusor pressure within 30 seconds or prior to the void voiding is a form of dyssynergia. So you can use UPP or urethral pressure profile for making a diagnosis of DSD. At this point, the International Continent Society regards UPP as a kind of experimental tool. Um, so most urodynamic units don't use it commonly for making a diagnosis. It's an experimental tool by and large. But unfortunately, there's a disconnect between what the ICS defines as dyssynergia and what is clinical practice. So when I say there's a disconnect, remember the definition. In the definition, it, uh, we know that dyssynergia is, is to be, the diagnosis should be made during voiding. Now, why is this important? We know that during storage, the hallmark of storage is that the bladder is silent, the outlet is tight. That's how we store and we don't leak urine. So the bladder is silent, is quiet, and the outlet is, is tight, that's storage. So it, during storage, ordinarily, we should not be making a diagnosis of dyssynergia. It should be during voiding, when the patient voids, we should be able to show that the sphincter has not relaxed or has become more tight, and that's a dyssynergic striated sphincteric activity. But actually, in practice, we often make our diagnosis during storage. So this is uh, the, the poll that was actually initiated by uh, Dr. Julia Nazir. And uh, I took this poll up from my side later, uh, a few weeks later. And you can see here that almost three quarters of respondents said that they would make a diagnosis of DSD during voiding. And uh, almost uh, one in six said they would, use, they would use either the voiding or the storage phase. Uh, why does this happen? Well, the fact is a large number of patients who have spinal cord lesions will not have a voiding phase at all. So they can't really void on commands. So if you tell them to void, they can't void. They can have a triggered contraction sometimes. They may be able, to be able to trigger a contraction either by squeezing the penis or stroking the lower part of the abdomen or, or, or tapping on the lower part of the abdomen. These things can cause a triggered contraction. But they don't really have a volitional contraction the way a neurologically intact individual does. So there's no true voiding. So if there's no true voiding, how do you have a voiding phase? Because you know, the voiding phase starts after the command to void is given, and then the patient initiates the void voluntarily, that's what the voiding phase is. So you can see here that in practice, we actually make a diagnosis of DSD, not just during voiding, but also during storage uh, in patients who don't actually have a true voiding. 
So this is the ICS definition, which says this is a feature of neurological voiding disorders. But let's look at a standard textbook, and this is Campbell's Urology, the 11th edition. And you can see here that even in Campbell's Urology, it's mentioned how DESD activity is noted with an involuntary contraction. And you can again see here, however, it is only the fluoroscopic view of the bladder outlet during an involuntary contraction that DESD is diagnosed. And an involuntary contraction, by definition, is a phasic contraction or diffuse overactivity, not a void. So you can see, even in standard textbooks, Detrusor sphincter dyssynergia has been described during the storage phase, not just during the voiding phase. So let me come back to that original slide. And I must caution you that these are personal views. Uh, uh, the original definition, the ICS definition of DST. Now, the ICS definition says there's a discoordination between the detrusor and sphincter muscle and the sphincter. But really, this is a presumption. We have no real method of of picking up signals from the smooth muscle at the internal sphincter. So number one, the internal sphincter is a zone that we are just not able to measure at this point. Number two, when we do pick up striated sphincteric activity, we have no good method of telling whether this striated sphincteric activity orig originates in the, in the external urethral sphincter or in the pelvic floor. And these are two different entities. So we are not really sure exactly what incoordination we are picking up. So there is an incoordination, but we don't have a good grasp because of technical limitations as to where this incoordination lies. The second problem with this definition is where they state that this discoordination could be between the detrusor and the smooth or the striated sphincter. Now I have a problem with this definition because an isolated this, this coordination with the smooth sphincter is what is actually the primary bladder neck obstruction. That is not really a neurological disease, uh, typically in patients. This is something that is, is noted in non-neurological patients also. Typically in neurological patients, you get a combination of smooth and striated sphincter dyssynergia or an isolated striated sphincter dyssynergia. But I don't see you getting isolated smooth sphincter dyssynergia. So I my take is that rather than have or here, it should have been smooth and striated, or striated and or smooth, putting it the other way around. So striated designer, sphincter designer in coordination and oblique or smooth sphincter in coordination. So that's the second uh, problem I have with this. The third is, of course, what we've already discussed, that this is during voiding. But really, in many patients, there's no voiding at all. And what we are looking at is dyssynergia with high intraprostatic pressures high intravesical pressures reflecting up into secondary reflux, upper tract dilatation, but this is all happening during phasic contractions during storage. And finally, what about patients? And we, we say that this, these are patients who have a neurological abnormality. And I told you that there's a counterpart to this where you get this synergia, but there's no neurological abnormality seen. And we give those patients the label of dysfunctional void. But the problem is the definition of dysfunctional void specifies the type of voiding that happens as an intermittent void. And it actually pre presumes that this is a learned, learned disorder where patients have mistrained their bladders. But there's a large group of patients in whom the voiding is, 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 is sustained. It's not an intermittent void. They are obstructed by a dysenergic striated sphincter, but there's no neurological lesion. And they are actually unclassified at this point with the ICS definitions. So there are certain problems with this definition, which we recognize, and hopefully we can correct this uh, in the next round of, of, of uh, ICS documents. There's another issue with DSD, or rather the, the lack of logic of DSD. Again, I must caution this is a personal point of view. Now, Imagine a situation where you have a patient with a spinal cord injury. They've got detrusive overactivity like this. So there's a high pressure at NDO. The patient has an incontinence, a small trickle of urine coming, and you don't pick up dilatation of the prostatic urethra, or you don't pick up EMG activity. You must have seen this fairly commonly in your units also. So not always will you pick up any EMG activity. So there's a phasic contraction, a small trickle of urine. Clearly, there was something obstructing the urine from coming out, because if the outlet was completely relaxed, you would have had a good flow with such a large high pressure contraction. So the fact that you had such a high pressure contraction and only a trickle of urine came out implies that there was outlet resistance. And if there is outlet resistance, how is this different whether from whether you give it a label of DSD or not? Because there is an outlet resistance with an intravesical rise in pressure. 
this is as dangerous as so-called classical DSD, where you actually show that there's prostatic urethral dilatation. So is the diagnosis of DSD specifically dangerous? Again, a personal point of view. Clearly, we know that DSD is a marker for high-risk neurogenic bladder. It's clearly a marker because patients who have DSD, they are more likely to have a problem. I would submit that DSD is as safe or as dangerous as an equivalent phasic pressure rise in another patient, unless the patient is permitted to or chooses to use that pressure of DSD for emptying the bladder. So if you allow a patient with DSD to use that phasic rise in pressure to empty their bladder, either by an expression technique or by triggered voiding, then your patient is going to get into trouble. That can have catastrophic consequences. So in other words, in any patient with high risk neurogenic bladder, the patient's ability to hold urine or the patient's ability to pass urine is not important. What is important is, is the patient holding urine at safe pressures and is a patient passing or emptying the bladder at safe pressures. If this is the underlying basic premise that you have in mind, you're not going to get into trouble whether the patient has DSD or doesn't have DSD, but just has phasic rises in pressure, they could be equally dangerous. So a very few words about the management. I'll try and wind up in five minutes. Um, you can you can either bypass the system or you can eliminate the disanage of contraction. It could be by intermittent catheterization, which forms the basis of management. External sphincterotomy only in men. I've had a woman in whom somebody did a striated sphincterotomy, which is an absolute disaster. We had to do an autologous rectus fascia sling on that woman to salvage her. Intrasphincteric botulinum toxin, prostatic stents, indwelling catheter, and uh, uh, as a last resort, you need diversion. Medication doesn't really help. Uh, you could use medication to treat the, neuro, the, the, the NDO or neurogenic detrusor overactivity, and that might help you with storage pressures, but there's no medication that sorts out the TSD itself. You could do an external sphincterotomy, as I said, in men, and then the patient needs to use a collection device. We won't go into the details of the technique by which you do this, except that uh, there is a long-term significant recurrence rates, and many patients require more than one such procedure in their lifetime. Uh, so you need to monitor whether the patient is actually doing well or developing a recurrence after the sphincterotomy. Intraprostatic stents are not very widely used for a wide variety of problems, including migration, stone formation, erosion, and so on. And finally, botulinum toxin in injection into the sphincter has been shown to help in a systematic review published recently. But there are certain concerns with this, which we actually wrote uh, to uh, Urology, the Gold Journal of Urology, and our letter is now in press, actually, uh, regarding whether the injections can actually lead to safe pressures in the lower tract, whether the patient can have freedom from intermittent catheterization, and what about the transient loss of control, which would happen every month over a lifetime if you're doing these injections, will those pressures add up and cause up tract changes? So there are certain concerns with all this and the mainstay of management remains the intermittent catheterization. So with this, I think I will, I will summarize what we've discussed today. DSD is often found in patients with high risk neurogenic bladder and it's a marker for patients with risk to the upper tracts. While ICS documents describe it as a voiding phase disorder in many patients is actually diagnosed during the storage phase uh, during involuntary contractions. Regardless of DSD, safe storage and safe voiding are critical in high risk neurogenic bladder patients. If a patient is allowed to empty the bladder spontaneously, the presence of DSD may place them at risk for upper tract damage and they must avoid any expression or uh, maneuvers or triggered voiding. I will end with uh, uh, saying that whenever feasible, the intermittent catheterization is the treatment of choice. Um, namaste or namaskar, that's a standard traditional Indian greeting for centuries. Uh, the namaste means not I. So when you do the folded hands greeting, it means not I. Or in other words, I am open to you, your presence, and your thoughts. Uh, this was actually first documented in the Rig Veda in 1500 BC uh, and is, is, is seen across all different temples in India. You can see this one from the 13th century where the person is standing with a folded hands position. The Namaste greeting has made its comeback because now you don't want to touch each other when you greet. So the Namaste or the Japanese bow uh, are, are two good methods of greeting each other. Thank you very much. I really appreciate, deeply appreciate uh, your invitation for this presentation and I've enjoyed doing it. Uh, and I hope now we have some time for discussion.